name is Ramesh Francis Khan, and I'm going to do a series with three main points. Point one is going to be truth exists. I'm going to show you how the galaxies, that is the big picture, the scriptures, that is the written picture, human nature, that's you, the living picture, and theology, that is the thought picture, all form the same truth. My second point to the series is that your life has purpose and meaning. Your life is worth living. The idea of uh, suicide and suicide bombings, it's a crazy idea, and I want to combat that. I once asked somebody, that, what is the purpose of living? And they answered wisely, the purpose of living is to live. And the third point to the series is, I want you to enjoy your life. I want to encourage you to develop a relationship with a God of your understanding, a loving God. I didn't say religion. I said, I want you to develop a relationship with a God of your understanding. I'm not here to tell you who God is or make any moralistic proclamations. There are enough idiots out there to do that. Okay, the recap, three points. Truth exists, your life has purpose and meaning, and God is worth discovering. classical argument for the existence of God. And there, it, there are many arguments for the existence of God. The classical most brilliant argument is the argument of intelligent design. Uh, this is a joke now. I'm going to sidetrack for a second. About a thousand years ago, a guy named Anselm put forward a different argument called the ontological argument for the existence of God. There are many arguments for the existence of God. But this one was so brilliant, and this part's a joke, that when Anselm got done telling his ontological argument for the existence of God, God was sitting on his throne, scratching his head, going, what did that guy say about me? Finally, Einstein said, I think he said you exist. And God was like, wow, thank God. That was a joke. Can you imagine God being confused about his own existence? Anyway, back to the serious point. Classical argument for the existence of God is the argument of intelligent design. Let me give you some examples of how that argument goes. Let's say you had all the parts of an airplane laying on a runway. Those parts would never assemble themselves by themselves. Organization implies intelligence. If you had all the parts of a computer, your computer, or a computer laying on your desk, those parts would never assemble themselves by themselves. If you had all the parts of a cell phone in your hand, the battery wouldn't even know where to put itself by itself without intelligence. So like I said before, intelligence implies organization. If I told you an airplane assembled itself by itself, you would say I'm crazy. If I told you a computer assembled itself by itself, you would say, can I have some of that drug you're taking? Now, if I told you a cell phone assembled itself by itself, you would say, son, what dumb school did you go to? And I would answer, University of Florida. I'm a gator, gotta admit it. And don't be a hater. I root for the U of M whenever they play, and we're not gonna say it, but anyway. Now, a cell phone. You don't even see the voice from your cell phone traveling from one phone to another, do you? But sound waves exist. I mean, it's amazing. You talk on the phone and somebody other than hears it. You don't see how that sound goes, but it happens. It exists. It's true. There are many things exist that you do not see, including you know who. Okay, classical argument. Organization shows intelligence and there are people who say that your eyeball assembled itself by itself. Now that is mind boggling to me, but they went to another school. We didn't attend the same class. See, your eyeball is infinitely complicated. More complicated, you're more complicated than, than anything in the universe. More complicated than an airplane, a computer, and a cell phone combined. No one can produce an, an eyeball, but they can produce those other things. Mankind cannot even produce a grain of sand. 
And a grain of sand is a very complicated thing. Just look at the atoms in it. Much more or less when we get to the subject of life, the living picture, which I'm not going to get to. Anyway, the reason I'm using the eyeball is because I want you to see the big picture. Put on your glasses. We're going to start looking at the galaxies, okay? Now, the galaxies are very well organized. There are approximately 100 billion galaxies out there with 300 billion stars per galaxy. Now, that's more money than Bill Gates had or Rockefeller had or even the guy from o Omaha, and we know his name. That's a lot of galaxies. As a matter of fact, that number is so big, it's bigger than all the sand on the sands, grains of sand on the seashore. It's bigger than all the grains of sand in the desert. It's bigger than all the grains of sand on this earth. And guess what they do? Those 100 billion galaxies with 300 billion stars form what's called constellations, grouping of stars that form pictures in the sky. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, God said, Let there be lights in the sky to serve as signs, and signs point to things. Now, I'm going to show you how the galaxies and the constellations and the scriptures all point to the same thing. And I'm going to add to it in the next section how the living picture and theology point to the same thing. And I'm going to add to the next section numerology and history and Einstein's equation and the solar system and the fundamental forces and profit. I'm going to show you a unifying theory of truth. Let's start with the big picture. The constellations, that is the grouping of stars, there's 88 of them up there in the sky. All the galaxies and all the stars form 88 pictures. We're going to look at 12 particular pictures. That's the particular pictures that the sun goes through each year. It goes through 12 pictures in the sky. The first picture it goes through that we're going to start with is Virgo. And Virgo is Latin for virgin beginnings. It's the longest group of stars that form a picture of a, in the sky that the sun goes through. Virgo lines up with Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates everything. He does every, that's the greatest amount of work in history. God creates the heavens and the earth. Virgo, Genesis chapter 1. The next chapter, the next um, group of stars we're going to look at, and by the way, a key verse in Genesis chapter 1 is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Virgin beginnings. Next group of stars we're going to look at, or the next sign, is Libra. And Libra is Latin for scales. Libra lines up perfectly with Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Here's the verse. The Lord commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. Okay, so you're free to eat from any tree, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you eat of it, and it's an ominous warning, you will surely die. Eat, don't eat. But when you do, if you do, you're going to die. Libra is a scale, it's eat or don't eat. But what's interesting about Libra is that Libra is the only constellation that does not, grouping of stars that form a picture, that does not represent a living thing. It represents a scale, it's judgment. And death is announced in Genesis chapter 2. If you do this, you're going to die. Fascinating, isn't it? Okay, so Virgo lines up with Genesis chapter 1, virgin beginnings. Libra lines up with Genesis chapter 2, uh, eat or don't eat. Scorpio, the next group of stars that come together is Scorpio, the next house, and these are in order, how the sun travels through the sky each year. Scorpio forms a picture of a scorpion. It comes from the idea of being infected with a poison by something that bites. And oh boy, did we get bit in Genesis chapter 3. The key verse in Genesis chapter 3, it lines up with Scorpio, is this. Verses 4 and 5. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Talking about that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Your eyes will be opened and you'll become like God's, knowing good from evil. Ladies and gentlemen, our faculty of perception is our deception. We were poisoned by a gift from something that bites. And look at the results in Genesis chapter 3, same chapter, verse 10. Adam said this right after he took of this knowledge of good and evil. 
He said, I, he said to God, he goes, I heard of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. I, 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 self-centeredness entered the world. And unfortunately, the ultimate result of self-centeredness is self-condemnation. And again, I tell you, your life is worth living. Truth exists. Your life has purpose and meaning. Live your life. Don't commit suicide. That's the ultimate self-condemnation. And God is worth discovering, okay? Before you ever do something that crazy, spend your life selflessly helping somebody else, okay? Don't think that everything is so bad that you self-condemn your, you know, you, 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 you do something crazy like that, okay? Look, this faculty of perception that we trust has caused every war, every murder, every rape, every genocide, because somebody thought it was a good idea. That is Scorpio, the poisonous faculty of perception, the knowledge of good and evil. A famous rabbi said this, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, treat people the way you want to be treated. In other words, use your heart, not your mind, to make judgments. Um, you know, do you want somebody to blow up your kids? You want somebody to just, your kids haven't eaten pizza? You want somebody to walk in and just blow them up? Then why do you send your child to blow somebody else's child up? Treat people the way you want to be treated. Okay? Not this. This, this will justify. This knowledge of good and evil, this faculty of perception will justify every murder, every rape, every atrocity. If somebody forgives you, for, offends you, forgive them and move on. Nobody's perfect. Anyway, the, we've all been infected with this poison, okay? And it separates us from self. That's the ultimate separation from self is suicide. Others, atrocities, that's the history of the world, murders, rapes, etc. unfortunate. And God. Adam said to God, I heard of you and I was afraid. And, and condemnation. Let me explain something to you. This faculty of perception again condemns us from God. Adam said, look, I heard of you and I was afraid. That's why people don't want to talk about God. The minute they talk about God, they're afraid. That's what Adam said. Why the essence of every, and let me tell you, the essence of every written picture, which lines up with that big picture, like for example, the Quran, it describes God, Allah, as merciful, compassionate, forgiving not condemning the Jewish scriptures, Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you that pardons sins and forgives transgressions, who delights to show mercy? You will throw all our sins and failures into the depths of the sea. You ever throw a rock into the sea? You know, the Jewish people are like overwhelmed with guilt in some ways. They're always having to please Hashem. So they want to make sure they do the right thing. But Hashem says to them, look, I'm going to take all your failures and throw them in the sea. And you ever throw a rock in the sea? In the depths of the sea, you'll never see it again. And from the Christian scriptures, uh, John 3, 16, God so loved the world. If you ever look at a picture of Jesus on a cross, God loved you so much he sent his son. All these written scriptures teach God loves you unconditionally. But our faculty of perception condemns us and separates us from him. And not only that, but the people that teach you about God, they had the same problem, the knowledge of good and evil. Anyway, this applies to secular teachers and religious teachers. They separate us with this faculty of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's move on. Okay, the next group of stars form the constellation Sagittarius. Sagittarius is the only constellation with a weapon. It's a half man, half bull. And in Genesis chapter 4, Four, look, God said, the day you eat of that faculty of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. They didn't die physically in Genesis chapter 3, Scorpio, but in Genesis chapter 4, because they took of that knowledge of good and evil, the first murder is recorded. The only constellation with a weapon, a bow and arrow, is Sagittarius, and many people throughout history have died from bow and arrows. And, you know, if it was, if it was, if it was done in modern time, it would be a rifle in his hand, okay? But the point is this, Genesis chapter 4, the key verse is verse 8. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Why did Cain kill Abel? Over religion. It was basically an argument as to who brought 
a better sacrifice to God. The first recorded murder in history is over religion using this faculty of perception, which is our deception, this knowledge of good and evil, because somebody thinks it's a great idea to kill somebody else, maybe because they don't agree with them, or, you know, God told them to. How insane is that? And, and by the way, that's going on today, okay? Many innocent people are being killed by extremists whose, whose knowledge of good and evil is their deception. Look at the Middle East, Muslims killing Muslims. Look at Belfast, uh, Northern Ireland back in the day, Christians killing Christians, and on and on it goes. Anyway, Genesis chapter four is Sagittarius, and it lines up with murder, the fa or death, murder and death, we kill people. Genesis chapter four is, is basically a story of, of, of man killing man, half bull, half man. A brother kills a brother, Cain kills Abel, but the bottom half is an animal. You ever wonder why in Genesis 4 the story of Lamech is there? Lamech kills a young man like an animal, and he brags about it. And that's the lowest point in human history. Now, the next group of stars form a picture of a sea goat, Capricorn. Capricorn is in the sea part of the sky, and it's the idea of a scapegoat. It comes from Leviticus 16. There were two goats brought before the priests. One would get away and one would die. And in Genesis chapter five, the key verse is 528. Uh, Noah, the birth of Noah is announced and his father says to him, he will comfort us. Now, isn't this fascinating that the idea of a scapegoat, that is two goats would come before a priest, one would die, one would live. That the, the flood is coming and, and the scapegoat is a sea goat. Noah is in the sea part of the constellations. Capricorn. I already gave it away. What's the next house? Aquarius, right? The announcement of the flood in Genesis chapter 6. Look, this stuff is all in order, okay? Noah's not announced in Genesis 6. He's not announced in Genesis 4. He's announced in Genesis 5. In Genesis 6, God says this. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under heavens and every creature has the breath of life in its nostril and Aquarius is the water bearer okay and he pours out that water and everything drowns now the next house is Genesis chapters is uh, the next key verse is in Genesis chapter 7 verse 22 is this everything on dry land that has the breath of life in its nostril dies well guess what house is next Pisces the double fish. Fish don't die from water, right? And why a double fish? We remember the story of Pharaoh and the double dreams? God wanted to make it so clear that a double fish to show, look, the seventh house lines up with the seventh chapter of Genesis, okay? You can't kill fish with water. Now, by the way, you ever wondered why, I'm going to take a little sidetrack here. You ever wonder why the second day of creation is the only day God said it, did not say it was good? He omitted that day. Now, if there's a God, an infinitely wise, and doesn't do, thing by, do things by accidents, remember? Intelligent organization implies intelligence. Genesis chapter 1, the only day that's not mentioned that's good is the second day. And why? Because God separated the firmaments, the waters above the heavens from the waters below the heavens. You ever wondered why that uh, people before the flood lived long and after the flood started living shorter? Because that, that firmament of water above the heavens filtered out the, the, the rays of the sun that ages us and causes us to die early. So when the flood occurred, Men, the, that watery canopy disappeared and people started living longer, uh, shorter. But God knew that he would use it someday to flood the earth and destroy mankind, whom he loved, because mankind became corrupt. And so it's the only day in Genesis chapter 1 he says it's not good. What a coincidence. An omission, a coincidence of omission, and I'm not going to omit the omission. Anyway. Let me go on this point about the flood. Let's look at something archaeologically real quick. 
There's a place in uh, South America called Lake Temacaca. It's about 10,000 feet up there. It has seahorses, okay? Every single mountain on, and every single mountain has seashells in it. Every single desert has marine shells in it. There's a lake up in Oregon. Now, let me ask, how did that, that seahorse get up in that lake, freshwater lake, 10,000 feet up there in South America if there wasn't a worldwide flood? There's a lake in uh, Oregon called Crater Lake. It's 10,000 miles up, and then you go uh, six, uh, six, 10,000 feet up, and then 6,000 feet down. There's a shrimp in that volcanic lake. How did that shrimp get in a lake? Did he take a bus? Mount Everest, 27,000 feet up, seashells. There's massive amounts of fossil records with, with marine life, birds, fish, and animals all intertwined on every single mountain and fossil beds that are miles long and hundreds of feet deep and wide. Remember I told you your faculty of perception is a deception. The fossil records show that there was a worldwide flood. How, nobody denies the fossil records. Nobody denies the data. It's how you interpret the data. But many people refuse to accept the fact that there was a worldwide flood. And, by coincidence, every single human culture, uh, major human culture that's recorded something in history, over 600 of them, independently, outside the internet, record worldwide flood. Now, I would say to myself, if these facts weren't true, if there were not seashells on every mountain, then this story of Genesis and the flood, worldwide flood, is a myth. The next group of stars we're gonna look at is uh, the constellation that forms a ram, Aries. And what's interesting about this is after Pisces, in Genesis chapter eight, verse 20, Noah does something very specific. He offers a burnt offering. And a burnt offering is described in Exodus 29:18. the burn the entire ram. What a coincidence. The next house is the house of a ram, and the burnt offering that Noah offers represents the ram. It is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It is exactly what Exodus 29, 18 says, and it's exactly what it says in Genesis 8. He does this burnt offering, and it's a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If you want to see this again, it's in Leviticus 16:3. This is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area. With a bull, that's going to be Taurus, the next one, for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. Genesis chapter 8, Noah does something specific. He offers not a grain offering, not a fellowship offering, not a thank offering. He offers a burnt offering. Burnt offering described as a ram, Aries. The reason I brought Leviticus 16.3 is because the next house is Taurus. And what a coincidence, huh? Aaron is supposed to offer a bull for his own sacrifice. He's a priest for his own sins. Guess what happens in Genesis chapter 9? The sin offering is for the anointed priest in Leviticus 4, 3, and supposed to be a bull. And Noah announces priestly blessings and curses, by the way in Genesis chapter nine. Pretty amazing, huh? That he acts as a priest because of sin and he offers that. Now, the 10th house is Gemini, the twins. Guess what follows in Genesis chapter 10? The table of nations. So-and-so gives birth to so-and-so. Two men in that house, that picture forms the twins, two men. And this man gives birth to this man. What a coincidence. Now, the next house that follows is the house of Cancer. And that's a picture of crabs. It's a symbol of confusion, actually. It's, uh, it's like, it's the faintest house in the, the zodiac. Of all the pictures in the skies that the sun goes through each year, that one's the faintest. You know why? Because we're going to go to the house of Leo, the coming of the Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. In Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to go to the 12th house, Leo. Uh, God tells Abraham, through your offspring, singular, will all the nations be blessed. The announcement of the Messiah, the coming Messiah in Genesis chapter 12. So, right before the coming of God or the Messiah or the Savior or whatever, 
before the end of the world will be confusion. And that's why cancer is the, is the dimmest house. And that's why in Genesis chapter 11, what a coincidence, confusion, the Tower of Babel. Now, if you don't believe the Tower of Babel is true, let me ask you another question. Where did all the groups of ethnic and linguistic diversities come from, or numbers come from? C.S. Lewis said this, he said, um, when Satan sends lies into the world, he send them into the world in peers, in a peer. In other words, a truth and a lie, a pair, something that looks good. In 1859, Darwin came along with a the theory of the origin of species. Great idea, Sur the survival of the fittest. But if we come from a common origin, where do all the languages of the earth come from? And where do all the cultures of the earth come from? There are infinite amount of cultural linguistic groups that have disappeared. American Indians, Aztecs, Incas, South American, Europe, so many ethnic and linguistic groups of people have disappeared. And I can't name them all to you, from the tabletop Indians in the Northwest to the Tequestas down in Miami, okay? Where do those languages come from? There's no new languages springing up. It's showing that we're going from infinite languages to finite languages. We didn't come from a common origin. Connect all the languages for me. Connect all the ethnic and linguistic groups for me from, from a common origin. If we had a common origin, they would all make, they would all be interrelated, but they're not. No, languages are very, very complicated and very, very diverse. As a matter of fact, in the French Revolution, when they wanted to disprove the existence of God, they, dis, they banned discussions on this very subject, the diversity of languages. Anyway, Tao Babel, confusion, cancer, confusion, and dimness before the coming of the line of the tribe of Judah. The Christians call him Jesus. The Jews call him Hashem. The Twelve is call him the coming one. But there is coming a Messiah. Now I tell you, the, 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 the beginning of this, the truth exists, your life has purpose and meaning, and God is worth discovering. There's one sub point. Question everything you've been taught. Question everything you believe including what I just taught you, because I lied to you. I did. There's a 13th constellation, ladies and gentlemen. See? Can't trust me. 13th constellation that the sun travels through each year. And if you think this is all coincidence, that these galaxies all blew up, form these pictures, line up with the scriptures, how did they know it, okay? How did they know that those galaxies, those 300 billion stars with 100 billion galaxies, and you can only see 3,000 stars with your naked eye. We're talking about 300 billion stars per galaxy with 100 billion galaxies, all form these pictures. And particularly these 12 pictures that line up with the scriptures. 2,000 years ago, Ptolemy figured, uh, named the constellations. About 1,000 years after that, a guy named Steve Langton uh, uh, divided the scriptures. Now, is that intelligent design or just a coincidence? Well, let me add one more for you before we end. I tell you, question everything you believe, including what I said, right? Because there's one more constellation that the sun travels through. It's right down here. It's called Ophicus. And in Genesis chapter 3, three verse 15, that constellation looks like this. And this is the promise of the coming Messiah. It's when Adam and Eve sinned, God said to Satan, I'm going to put warfare between you, Satan, and the woman, the human race, and an, evil, and a, and an invisible race that's deceived us, a wicked race, demons, angels, whoever. I'm going to put warfare between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You will strike his heel, and he will crush your head. Look, the foot of a fecus is standing on and look at this picture it's a guy that's fighting a serpent as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness as the if at the son of man will be lifted up okay the promise of the messiah 
Moses was a promise. I mean, this, this is to the Jews. That is Moses holding up the serpent. The foot of Ophicus is standing on Sagittarius and Scorpio. The poison and the one that created death. And the promise of a savior is right on the foot of both of those houses. Is that a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen? Is that a coincidence that the sky and the planets and all that stuff line up? What is the purpose of this? Let's recap, okay? The purpose of the series is to show that one, truth exists. Number two, that your life has purpose and meaning. And number three, God is worth discovering. For you to enjoy your life, I'm trying to encourage you to develop a relationship with a God of your understanding, a loving God, okay? So, remember the classical argument for the existence of God? Intelligent design? Organization implies intelligence? Let's recap. There are more stars in the galaxy than there are sands, grains of sand upon this planet. How did all these stars, hundreds of billions of stars with hundreds of billions of galaxies, form these constellations, these pictures, these signs in the sky? And particularly the 12 signs that we're looking at, the zodiac that the sun passes through each year. If an intelligent God didn't put it in that order, how did it happen? Now, I'm going to ask you a different question. How did the prophet Moses, 3,500 years ago, know to write the book of Genesis in the exact order that matches those galaxies? If an intelligent God did not design both of them. Remember, organization implies intelligence. How did Ptolemy, the astronomer, approximately 2,000 years ago, know that these stars all fall in these pictures. How did he figure that out unless it was revealed to him? Now, how did Stephen Langton, approximately a thousand years ago, divide the books of the Bible, the chapters of the Bible, and particularly the first 12 chapters of Genesis, in that order? How did he know to div divide the chapters up like that a thousand years ago? These are independent. They did not collaborate this stuff, okay? Truth exists. The point is simply this. The galaxies from the beginning of time, the scriptures from the beginning of writing, the prophets from Moses onward, the astronomer from Ptolemy onward, the scribe from ancient days, all tell the same story. Are you okay with that? I mean, are you okay with that? Because we're going to go to the living picture. Okay with that? living picture, in the beginning, past, present, and future time, first verse of the Bible, God, the circle, do you know why they have a ring at a wedding? Because it's unending. The circle stands for eternity. So in the beginning, God, the circle, created what? The heavens, the top finger, and the earth. Wow. What a coincidence. The first verse of the Bible is on my hand. I'm a living picture. You think about that. Till next time.